certainly appreciate everyone uh, uh, that signed on tonight. And I'm very pleased to be able to present this lesson to you tonight. And um, something that you've uh, heard before, you know, there are many things that we've uh, learned from the Holy Scriptures that we use to guide our conduct in this life of flesh. Now, often the uh, the writer of the Holy uh, Volume has asked us to remember uh, what we already know, uh, such as in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse five, and Paul said, "Do you not remember?" that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Or Peter's words recorded in Second Peter, the first chapter, verse 12, for this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Therefore, the things that I will say tonight, you already know and are quite Familiar with them. I am uh, merely bringing them to your remembrance. Of course, this is done in hope that uh, none will be like the one spoken of uh, or spoken to by Abraham, as recorded in Luke 16, chapter verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. So let us uh, remember that uh, most important question that can ever be asked. But the uh, sad thing is most will never enter, entertain that question. What must I do to be saved? It is a responsibility that rests upon every person. We know that every single person should consider that query seriously and earnestly answer the same. Now, I know that uh, most will never do so and will be made like the rich man to remember his failure to answer the question honestly asked. I believe that uh, you uh, joining in tonight are interested in and most know the correct answer to this question. We have learned that if, if it is possible for us to gain the whole world and lose our own souls, a failure to answer this question would condemn our passage through life in the flesh as a tragedy. Therefore, may we with seriousness, solemnity, and prayerfulness learn the truth and obey it from the heart. Before I continue further, I say uh, that the answer presented here to the question, uh, what must I do to be saved, is not purported to be exhaustive. There are many other things that possibly might enter in, into some way or another into a discussion of this kind. There are various things in the Bible to which salvation is attributed. Confusion is on every hand because of our failure to appreciate this fact. For instance, no one who understands the Bible would deny that we are saved by love, that we're saved by mercy, that we're saved by God's goodness, by the life, the death, the blood, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and other things. Now, all those things are included in the answer to what must I do to be saved. And I'd, I'd be remiss to exclude any one of those things or isolate them uh, from all others and claim that salvation is conditioned upon one enumerated item alone. Just as such a misconception has characterized many an earnest and sincere endeavor, or maybe not so earnest or sincere endeavor, and led some blindly in confusion and error and at the judgment, disappointment in the presence of God. I am, I am, however, limiting my scope of the discussion to that which I present hereafter. <clears throat> in this physical life, we live and have our being and are saved by 
different elements working in concert with other elements. To sustain life and flesh, we must, among other things, breathe, take sustenance, sleep, and exercise. It would not accomplish the desired end for you to live by one of these necessities alone. Yet when it comes to spiritual matters, it does seem as if, in the face of all illustrations to the contrary, that there is a disposition to reason after this fashion. With all such uh, preliminary matters aside, let us consider the question uh, directly. What must I do to be saved? Now we will emphasize here every word that makes up that essential and sublime query. To begin, what must I do? The very first word implies that certainly there is something to be done. What is the what? But note the next. It is not a question of what may I do or what can I do or what could I do? But the strongest imperative in our language is brought to bear to make the impression, what must I do? If God Almighty endorses the declaration that man must do something, there is no alternative open to man whereby he can set aside such a positive and sacred obligation. So it is, what must I do? I doubt there is a person tuned in tonight who thinks or feels that like he or she is an exception to that obligation, that the force of such is not binding on each accountable person. If so, regrettably, he is walking in the darkness and delusion characterizes his thinking. But note again, it is not what must my grandmother do. It's not a question of what must my father do uh, to be saved. That was never asked or answered. But this question is individual and personal. What must I, that is you and me, do to be saved? Many people are convicted of the truth and see the beauty and simplicity thereof, but refuse to accept it on the ground that if I were to do it, that would mean that some loved one was lost and living in torment. Well, if they are, can you help it? If they have not yet passed from this life and flesh, perhaps you can render them a service and uh, benefit. Uh, instead of the query being asked in the second person, it is in the first person. Lord, what must I individually and personally do to be saved? If all other men on earth were to be lost, that doesn't argue that I must be. On the other hand, if all other people on the earth were to be saved, that doesn't prove that I will be saved. It is not a question of what the church with which I am affiliated believes or does. It is not a question of what kind of mother I had or have. It is not a question of how somebody else sought the way of the Lord. It is purely a question of what must I do. That question is both uh, forceful and serious. Further, it is a question of what must I do? There never was a question uh, as this asked, Lord, what must I acquire to be saved? But it is a question of what must I do? Contrary to popular opinion, the, the religion of the Bible is a religion of doing. It is a religion of activity. It is a religion of practice. It is life of, a life of service. You take the quote unquote do out of the Bible, 
and from the obligations resting upon man, and you have robbed that religion that is pure and undefiled of the very foundation upon which God intended it should rest uh, forever. But Father, this is not a question of what must I do to save myself, but what must I do to be saved? It is both active and passive. I must do something. And at the same time, I must be saved, if saved at all. Therefore, man's part is, I must do. And God's part is, to save. And to extend the favor of mercy and forgiveness. Now that is the question before us, uh, but uh, various answers are frequently given. There are those who deny outright or by example that God would condemn anyone regardless of their conduct. I, I know you've had the same experience, but I've never been to a, a funeral of any worldly person who was not preached into heaven. So I always make a point to pass by the cast to be sure that uh, bodies have not been switched. Of course, the Calvinist would say that one is saved if that person was among the final number elected by God for salvation. According to them, there is, there is not one thing that was, uh, one must do or can do to be saved or lost for that matter. Now, I have a friend that uh, he re recently mentioned that a non-mutual friend, an atheist friend of his, is a good moral person. Now, I have no doubt that such a one pays his bill, uh, kisses his wife, and doesn't kick the dog. Now, some would say that treating your fellow man right, uh, living a good, clean, upright life, is the essence of Christianity. <clears throat> Bowing in submission to Prince Emmanuel is desirable, but ultimately unnecessary. Good deeds and correct living will save you, uh, so they aver. But bear in mind that no man ever was or ever will be saved on account of his goodness. Such a man, unfortunately, forgets that Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That man has forgotten that the Savior said most assuredly that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Therefore, morality, uh, although a good and essential element of Christian living, is weighed in the balance and found warning when it stops short of the duty I owe to the God of my being. What must I do to be saved? That question under the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ has been asked uh, practically three times in the book of, of Acts of the Apostles. The answers are given uh, here too, there too, and strange as it may seem to the uninformed, a different answer was given each time it was asked. Uh, that is no cause for concern. There is no justification to consider the answers as incomplete because the answer, answer or the question was asked three times and each time a different answer was given. The first time the question was asked, uh, or I should say at least the first one cited tonight, is found in Acts 16. And you can read that whole chapter do you good. The query was uh, put to a jailer of the Philippians in the country of Macedonia, into which uh, some gospel preachers had come. That man said to Paul and Silas, what? must I do to be saved? The answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, the same thing was asked those at, uh, at Pentecost. 
when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, the answer to that question was not like the first one. This time, the same Holy Spirit said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, that is different, a different answer from the first, uh, the first one cited. The third time, Saul of Tarsus uh, stricken down on the, that public highway leading to Damascus, and he was face to face with the Lord, said, what do you want me to do? The answer was, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Following out that story to its ultimate end, the final response, uh, which came from the mouth of Ananias, was, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Each query was essentially the same. Each wanted to know, what must I do to be saved? That is what the Bible says about it in Acts 16, Acts 2, Acts 9, and Acts 22. As noted, the answer to each query was different. Or were they? Let me harmonize each answer by giving a, an illustration. Uh, next week, we are, Nancy and I are headed to San Antonio to the airport to pick up Keith. Uh, he has a conference in San Antonio all week, so we will spend that week with him. If I were to ask uh, someone in this subdivision how to get to the San Antonio airport, and, of course, we're assuming no Google Maps, of course. They might say, well, you uh, head out of the subdivision, you drive down to I-10 and head west. <clears throat> uh, once I got to San Antonio, I may stop and ask again how to get to the airport. They would say to take uh, such and such a route, but they would not say first, I have to head out of my subdivision and drive down to I-10 and head west. Now, my destination is the same, but they would take me at the place I occupy at the time the query is made and provide the unfilled steps from that point forward. Well, you, you could uh, uh, devise any number of illustrations that I, you know, the illustration could be that of making a batch of cookies from a uh, recipe. Recipe could call for so much flour, shortening, sugar to be mixed and rolled out with a rolling pin. Then it calls uh, for it to be rolled up and refrigerated for a few days. And after the few days are up, you take out the roll and again refer to the recipe. But you don't start at the beginning of the recipe. <clears throat> you pick up where you left off. Now, everyone understands the import of uh, these examples. <clears throat> One does not go back over what he already knows or has fulfilled. Now that is the idea of each question answered in Acts 16, Acts 2, Acts 9, and Acts 22. Every one of these answers was answered exactly right. And if uh, both uh, direction givers had said, I first had a head, of my, head out of my driveway, only one answer would have been right. And that's just simple common sense. They answered me according to where I was standing at the time of the query was put to them. Applying the same principle to the Bible question in these three instances, you will be able to appreciate the uh, variation and the harmony in the things that are said in response there too. Now let's uh, consider our first man, the Philippian jailer. He was a heathen in a heathen land, uh, so as far as religion was concerned, Christian religion was concerned. Paul and his company had but uh, recently gone there in answer to the uh, vision, so-called Macedonian call, but they had gone out uh, by the riverside and had spoken to the women who had gathered there. But of that, the uh, jailer knew nothing didn't know who they were. Uh, in time, uh, Paul caused a spirit of 
divination to come out of a maid. And as a result, her masters took Paul and his companions, and as Paul said, had them beaten openly to uncondemn Romans. Finally, these men of God were delivered into the jailer for the charge to keep them securely. In fulfillment thereof, the record says, he put them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. It is doubtful that the jailer had even seen such men like these in all his life. Uh, they were ministers of the gospel of Christ. And he was an un unlearned heathen. When the midnight hour approached, there was a great earthquake. And the foundation of the prison was shaken. The doors were opened. And every man's bands were loosed. The jailer became so distressed at the prospect of escaped prisoners that he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. <clears throat> but Paul calmly and quietly allayed his concern and said, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. The jailer then called for light and sprang in and came trembling and fell before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, what must I do to be saved? Well, what kind of man do you have here? <clears throat> this is a man starting out, if you please, at the very beginning. A man who has never taken one single step, who had never traveled the road that leads to salvation one single mile. And therefore, at the time he raised the question, what must I do to be saved? Paul answers at the very beginning, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, a man cannot believe on him of whom he has not heard. But uh, Paul told this man to believe. Believe what? And hence the next part of the story connects directly to Paul's answer. <clears throat> After having given that command about believing, the Bible says, <clears throat> Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Why is that? In order that the man might have something to believe. They preached unto him God's word. And in preaching the word of the Lord to that man, it led him into further obedience. As a result of having preached unto him the word of the Lord, the Bible says that the jailer took these prisoners that very night, that same hour, and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his household were baptized. After the uh, baptizing, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. What did the man do in response to the question? What must I do to be saved? First, he heard the gospel proclaimed by the fearless apostle unto the Gentile world. Second, he believed the gospel. Did he repent? Well, the Bible does not mention that. And yet the implication is that he did. For Paul would have never baptized a man who had not repented of his sins. And why should he? In addition to having heard and having believed and having repented, the Bible says that he was immediately baptized at the same hour of the night. From your reading of the conversions in the New Testament, you will note that under the reign of Christ, there is not a case on record of where any man ever rejoiced on account of his sins being forgiven until after he was baptized. You will also note that whenever a man heard the gospel, believed it and obeyed it, or had the disposition to obey it, you cannot find a single case where anyone ever stopped to eat, drink, or sleep until he's baptized. <clears throat> 
And yet the world says baptism counts but little. Are such doings merely incidental or accidental? Or were they done to emphasize the importance of rendering obedient straightway to the word of God? Is a jailer's conversion in harmony with the commission that said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Go, make disciples of all nations. The commission declared that the gospel was to be preached, and that is what Paul spoke unto the jailer. The Bible is, uh, in the commission declared, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. The jailer would say, if we can put words in his mouth, I heard, I believed, I was baptized. Only then did I rejoice. Why did the jailer rejoice? Because he was, at that point, standing on the promises of God Almighty. Now I call your attention to the Jews on Pentecost, who, unlike the jailer at the time the question was asked, had already heard the gospel and had believed it. That was evidenced by the fact that they were pierced in the hearts, convicted of sin, and they were anxious to be rid of its consequences. <clears throat> Hence they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter did not reply by saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for this they had already done. But from that point, he told them the way from their own, in these words, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They that received his word were baptized, and the same day were added to them, that is, to the church. Did the conversion of these and the conditions obeyed differ from those of the jailer? By comparison, we find the following. All heard the gospel. All believed the gospel. All repented of their sins. And the Bible says specifically that all were baptized. <clears throat> Therefore, according to the language of Christ in the commission, all were saved and they had the right and reason to rejoice because of the forgiveness of sins and the hope of everlasting blessedness. I next call your attention to Saul of Tarsus, a record of whose conversion is, uh, is found in Acts 9, uh, chapter 22 and 26. So what are the facts in the reference to him? <clears throat> well, he had secured letters from the chief priest permitting him to go to Damascus to bring back uh, men and women who called on the name of the Lord. As he drew near to the city, a light shone about him uh, above the brightness of the noonday sun. And a voice was heard saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? The answer was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Then Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? If there was ever a time when Jesus Christ should give direct answer, this seems to be the occasion. But it should be remembered that the gospel, God's power to save, had already been delivered unto earthen vessels. And hence the Savior's failure to respond directly to Saul's question. He only said this, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul was led uh, by the hand of his companions to the city of Damascus, where for three days and, night, and three nights he neither ate nor drank, but was in a patient, prayerful mood. The Lord had appeared to Ananias, an earthen vessel and had directed him to the very spot where Paul was. When convinced of his duty, Ananias went and found Saul. 
who had been directed thither with the assurance that he would be told what he must do. Ananias did not tell him, as Paul told the jailer, to believe on the Lord, for this he had already done. Either did he tell him, as Peter told those on Pentecost, to repent. Why not? Because Saul had already heard the story of the cross, and I saw that he was a penitent believer, and he simply told him the things that remained undone in these paraphrased words. Saul, seeing you are a penitent and a believer, and since I have been ordered to direct you, let me ask that you arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is what the Lord said must be done, for it is the only thing demanded of Saul at this time by Ananias. <clears throat> Therefore, the important question, what must I do to be saved? was answered on three different occasions with a view to the condition of the characters at the time he was put to them. When analyzed and understood, the answers uh, there too are absolutely one and the same. As a final summary, it is simply this. Hear the gospel of the Son of God. Believe the gospel with all your heart, honestly and truly repent of all your sins and walk down into the water as did Philip and the Ethiopian uh, treasure. And there, upon a public confession of your faith in the crucified Jesus, be buried for the remission of sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Arise there from, uh, from to walk in newness of life, and then walk in it the remnant of your days. If you will do this, and we'll faithful to that pledge made by you and to that obligation assumed by you when you put off this tabernacle of flesh God will send his angels to bear you up to the bosom of Abraham and that is the lesson for tonight appreciate your kind attendance attention <clears throat>